On Christmas Eve 1968, the Apollo 8 and its astronauts Anders and Borman flew around the back of the moon for the first time in human history and came towards a little blue-green planet resting in the middle of space and took the first picture of this planet that's now become iconic to we humans. We've seen the picture everywhere. Up until that point, it was the first time that we'd seen a little blue-green planet. It's a finite planet. This little planet in the middle of space. It's a finite planet with a clear boundary. Since that time, the number of people on the planet has doubled. The size of the economy has gone up fourfold. Infant mortality has reduced from 150 per thousand to 50 per thousand. Remarkable advances uh, during that time. Um, in addition, we've seen the emergence of climate change. We've seen the emergence of the obesity pandemic. Over that time, roughly over a 50-year period, the number of people who are hungry on the planet has remained resolutely stable at around about a billion people. The proportion has declined since the 1960s, but the total out of 7 billion people is 1 billion hungry. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about progress in agriculture and talk about how it influences our little blue-green planet and what we might do about it in the future. We've seen remarkable progress over this period, really dramatic progress in terms of the total food production um, over the period. We've seen total food production in, in Asia increase almost sevenfold, in Latin America sixfold, in Africa almost fourfold. In Europe and North America less because they were starting from a higher base. They had a lot of their increases in an earlier part of the, of, of the phase. So we're producing more food even though we've got double the number of, of people in the world. Individual crops have changed as well, and those have changed in terms of productivity. UK wheat now averages about, around about eight tonnes per hectare. This year has been the most successful year of uh, uh, yields for wheat, slightly more than eight tonnes per hectare. Um, so increases over time, rice in China, rice in Japan, uh, uh, wheat in the USA almost doubled in terms of yields over the same period of time. So dramatic changes in the amount of food that we're getting from the land. If we compare the amount of food with the number of people, then we find that the, in most places, except for one important exception, there is more food per person. So if you look at the green dots, it's the amount, the per capita food per person across the whole world, about 45% more food per person than in the time when Apollo 8 was flying up to the moon and back again. Um, in Asia, much higher increase. In Africa, that's the exception. We find that across Africa, food production declined in the 70s and 80s when there were very important, significant droughts, and has only just made it across the line of where it was in the early 1960s, food per person. So that remains a, uh, an important challenge. One of the things that we came to understand during this period is that, that agricultural production, even though it's very productive, producing lots of food, came at some cost. And those costs were environmental and health costs. The first person to draw attention to this was uh, the famous Rachel Carson, an American scientist and author um, who wrote a famous book called Silent Spring in 1961, where she focused on the effect of pesticides used as a seed treatment and how they had an impact upon bird populations, killing the birds and thereby making the spring silent. We did some work over a period of time and published a book in 1991, big brick of a book called Unwelcome Harvest, where we looked at, myself and my colleague Gordon Conway, we looked at the impacts of fertilizers, of pesticides, of bacterial contamination of food, of loss of wildlife and hedgerows, um, impacts upon the climate from gaseous emissions from agriculture to look at the unwelcome harvest part of the important harvest that is helping to feed us, and to build this understanding that the productivity increases were coming at some cost. Uh, we didn't at that time know what the cost was, but we were concerned about understanding where they came from. And we see this picture in landscapes uh, uh, across the world. The picture on the top left is from the Java coast, soil erosion from productive 
uh, fields up in the highlands of Java is creating new lands out in the sea, which are then being colonized for further agriculture, um, interestingly. Uh, pesticides in, in uh, uh, Kenya um, still being used that were banned in the early 1960s in Europe and North America. Lindane, Dawa Yamboga, which is medicine for insects in Swahili. Um, and so still likely to be causing human health effects as wildlife. And farm wastes in lots of different ways impacting upon waterways. So we just have to cast our eyes across a farm landscape to pick up some of these, these external effects of agriculture. Um, interestingly, there's a, a positive that agriculture benefits from. And it's worth noting, and we're talking here about these, uh, what I'm going to be calling in a moment, spillover effects, the effects of one system on another one. If you grow stuff near to a road, you benefit from the pollution from the traffic. So the, the pollution that comes from the traffic in the UK produces nitrogen oxides which come into the atmosphere and come down as either dry or wet deposition and produce around about 30 kilograms of favorable nitrogen per hectare for agriculture. So agriculture f receives a free input of, of, from pollution. In fact, there is no such thing as a strictly organic farm in Europe or North America, because they all receive free pollution. So if we switch to um, electric vehicles one day, and we hope that that will be something we see, uh, agriculture will need to start using more fertilizers to remain as productive. So we're getting movements of good things and bad things which might become good things when they move somewhere else. In the year 2000, we published a piece of work in a journal called Agricultural Systems where we calculated the, did the first study of the national costs of agriculture on the environment. And the top uh, uh, bar there is the agricultural externalities in the UK amounted to around about one and a half billion pounds worth of costs imposed elsewhere in the UK. Uh, note the bottom bar shows you that net farm income is about the same. So farmers were earning about the same as the costs they were pushing out onto the rest of society, which is paying through its back pocket because those are costs that have to be picked up somewhere in the system. So that was the first step. We're looking at boundaries here. I'm going to come back to our finite planet and boundaries in a moment. The boundary of the farm and from the farm gate impacting around, upon the rest of, the, of, of, of Britain was around about one and a half billion. If you then looked at the food miles, the costs of moving the food from the farm to the retail sector, we find that's 2.4 billion, much greater than the farm costs. Then if you add on the costs of moving the food from where you buy it back to your home, it's, not, it's another 1.3 billion. So the impacts of activities on the environment and how you measure them are very strongly determined by boundaries of, of systems. In this case, whether you look at the whole system or just the farm, or in the end, whether you look at the hard single boundary of our little blue-green planet. So now we kind of start to understand that the costs, the, um, the cost of the externalities of agriculture are having an impact, and what we'd like to do is somehow to deal with those. Uh, it's also true that agriculture has positive side effects. It shapes landscapes, whether cropped agriculture or whether livestock agriculture, producing culturally important landscapes as well as places that produce food. Uh, the rice cultures of China and of southern India have been farming in the same sort of way year after year for six to 7,000 years shaping whole landscapes, providing important ecosystem services by holding the water in one place and still being productive. So there is a component here that agriculture is a shaper. The food production systems are positive shapers of landscapes in ways that, that are important to, to um, us and to whole cultures. I'd like to show you a little demonstration here of three different types of agricultural system on our little blue-green planet, just to make a little point about externalities. We have very productive agriculture, the wheat systems that I told you earlier on, that produce around about eight tons per hectare. Imagine this is a bar graph, so there's one bar, okay, eight tons per hectare. There are certain sorts of agriculture that trade off pr productivity for a little bit of sustainability, so they don't produce as much but they reduce their impacts upon the environment. So in a sense, they're taking some of the costs 
from the outside and imposing them on the inside. So they're less productive, uh, but um, uh, greener in some sort of way. On the third type of system, we have very persistent agricultural systems across the world where the average yield is between 0.5 and 1 tonne per hectare. Around about 2.5 billion people rely on this type of agriculture. So the challenge for us is to find ways to close the gap between this kind of system and the other ones. Now, the problem with this system is actually it has produced substantial spillover effects. So the agriculture has been productive, but it's produced spillover effects that are held within the border of our little blue-green planet. There's no escape from this boundary. Little bit, you know, we get sunshine in, little bit of escape um, at the edge of the atmosphere. But mostly what is inside happens inside and affects systems inside that, that, um, uh, that single blue-green planet. So the spillover effects are something that we would like in some sort of way uh, to, to reduce. Uh, productive agriculture, some of it um, uh, uh, is, is very effective, as we see here, at producing food, um, but we still, we still have produced agricultural systems that are failing in many parts of the world, in this case with salinity in the top here and drought at the bottom. A lot of these are the low producing agricultural systems. They're not having any particular negative impact. They're not having these spillover effects, uh, but they're not productive enough. So how do we close that bit of the, of the challenge? Well, here are two words that we've focused on for a number of years, difficult words to tie down, coming from very different contexts, sustainable and intensification. Sustainable is a good word, sort of thing we all want something that will last for a long time that's good for the environment. Intensification was a term that was used for a long time for those types of agricultural systems that produced a lot, but unfortunately produced it in a way that had a negative side effect. And one of the things that we've done here is to put the two terms together and say, you know what, we haven't got a lot of land, we've got a lot of people, We've got a challenge to feed more people because there'll be two billion more people by the middle part of this century, and there are still a billion people hungry. So we've got to produce more, but do it in a way that is sustainable, producing more from the same piece of land. So there are three components to the challenge here. Um, one is we can work on the genetic factors, the crops and the livestock that are part of our systems. We can work on the agroecology, how different components of systems interact with each other and search for synergies, search for services that may be supplied by different components of systems. And then at the third level, we can work on the social and institutional factors that shape the very systems themselves. There's been a lot of work on this. Um, I've published books on, on how we can make movements towards that. British government, uh, Foresight Government Office of Science has done the same. The Royal Society has worked in a similar way to set out how we can reap the benefits from sustainable intensification. Some people say, you don't really need that. We could just move into the unused lands of the world, those areas that are currently not being used for agriculture. The thing is, most of them are very effective at some other use. So the rainforest of Tikal and Guatemala here, or a 2,000-year-old baobab tree in Burkina Faso here, we could chop them down for agriculture, but there would be a significant cost. Where that has happened, the cost is only too clear. Here in, in uh, uh, Cambodia, you chop down the forest, the important wild foods that people rely upon uh, to feed themselves, and the important habitats that look after the animals that we think are important, also disappear. So we lose an important part if we spread into new areas. So let me give very quickly five examples of sustainable intensification where we have been able to make changes to systems to make them more productive, but at the same time more sustainable. Conservation agriculture. In the early 1990s, farmers in Brazil and Argentina came up with the idea that it would be better not to plough. Farmers have been doing it for 5,000 years. They broke a rule. They said, well, what we'll do is we'll just sow the soya bean directly into the wheat and the wheat back into the soya bean afterwards. And if we do that, we end up creating soils that are rich in carbon and become a carbon store, thereby helping to prevent climate change. 150 million hectares 
and now under conservation agriculture around the world. The magic bean, this is a bean called Makuna, Makuna Purians, the velvet bean, has been developed by farmers in Honduras and in Brazil here, putting the bean as a rotation and as a mixed crop with maize. It's an old idea, but it's a crop that's very effective. And what it's used for is what's called a green manure. You don't grow the bean to eat it or feed it to livestock, you grow it to feed the soil. Add it to the soil and you can change soil like this in two years from something that's unproductive to something that's very productive and will last a long time. Pest management. If you integrate your pest management, we, we learn important lessons from rice-based systems in Asia. If you apply pesticides to rice, what happens is you not kill the pests, but you also kill the good insects. You kill the predators and the parasitoids and the spiders and other things that are good at controlling pests. Take pesticides out, look after the good insects, and you find that they can do a job for you just as well. One of the things you lose from irrigated rice systems uh, when you apply pesticides is the fish dye. And many traditional systems grow fish in with the wet rice. You can get a ton of fish per hectare if you stop using pesticides. And this is another advance that's been made. Rice ears might not change, but you get a lot more fish. Fourthly, soil conservation and agroforestry, a dramatic revolution happening in the Sahel and in the Sahara of, of, of Central and West Africa. Simply digging holes to gather water, to focus it together, to put nutrients in particular places for vegetables, for maize, for uh, trees in this way, can change whole landscapes. And here's a picture of an area of Niger, Tahua province. On the left side, satellite photograph in 1975. On the right side, the same place 30 years later. Many people believe that desertification is a threat and it's getting worse. Actually, in many parts of the world, it's going in an opposite direction. Things are getting better because there's the social capital, the ideas about sustainable intensification that are changing these landscapes. And finally, fertilizer fallows. In southern Africa, the use of what they call fertilizer trees, putting trees into rotations that used to be maize, 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 maize over five years. You go maize, 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 and then plant trees for two years. And those three years produce more food than the previous five years added up. But it's a break in the way that farmers see the world. So you have to work very closely with them to get those sorts of changes. Dramatic changes in yield and productivity, particularly in Malawi. And finally, the component that matters in all of this is getting the people working together. So the importance of social capital and institutions to provide the stability for the change is critical um, in all of this. Uh, working not just on the crops or the technologies, but working with the people in particular ways so you can change whole landscapes remains a, a vital part of the challenge. And just to give you, this is from some of the work that we did in recent years where we looked at 286 projects in 57 countries uh, and compared the yields before and after and with and without. And you can see the relative yield changes here. On the left side are the low producing systems would get a larger proportional increase in productivity. So the systems with the low yields are able to produce large increases in productivity. The sorts of changes are like this. San Martin Hill of at the top here in Guatemala, a five-year change in a landscape, Madurai in southern India, a change in a landscape over a two-year period. These sorts of changes are things that we have to understand are possible in the first place before we can then proceed to make them over a long period. So this just brings me to the final part of my, my presentation here. I have here in this bottle um, uh, uh, some sustainability juice. Um, and it's green. You can see it's green, can't you? So what we can find out is that if we add that to the poorest systems, we can get the largest amount of yield. If we add it to the middle systems, we can make them a little bit greener and we can get a little bit more productivity. If we make the very productive systems more sustainable, there's not going to be much change in yield, but we'll make them greener. So the way in the end to save the planet, to feed the people, to make sure that the future is successful for all is to work on the system on the right side. Thank you very much.